Hey guys, welcome to 11.2 series. When we talked about sequences, we wrote things like this, an equals and some rule in n. And we wrote this way, an might be an f of n, a known function. The surprising thing we're going to do now is there are known functions that we don't really are, know how to calculate, cosine, uh, arctangent, all sorts of functions that are very difficult, even square root of x. What we're going to do is we're going to come up with infinite long rules so that we can get these values as approximately as, as necessary. But in order to do that, we actually have to take sequences and add them up. So if we have a sequence like a n equals 1, 1 half, 1 fourth, 1 a, you know this rule, a n equals 1 over 2 to the n, n starts at 0. Now this is a famous sequence because if you're here at 0 and you want to go to 1 and you go halfway, well you've traveled a distance 1 half Oops, if you want to start that over again. Suppose you want to go to 2. If you take one step and go half the way there, there's a 0, which is one step. Now, there's a distance 1 left to go. And if you go half the distance again, that's 1 half, which is a 1. And that's this number. Now, you've gone 1 and a half which means half is left. If you go half that remaining distance, you go a quarter, which is this number. And if you go half the remaining distance again, you go an eighth. Now, you can see that you're getting closer and closer and closer to two, but what you're actually doing is you're creating a series. You're taking a zero, and then you're doing a zero plus a one. So here was a zero, one. Here's a zero plus a one, one and a half. And then here's a0 plus a1 plus a2. That's all the way out to here. Even though these are sizes, the steps, when added up, produce 1, 1 plus a half, 1 plus a half, plus a quarter. And this is 1, 1.5, 1.75. And now this process looks clearly, as n goes to infinity, it looks like you're heading towards 2. What are we going to call this? Well, we're going to call this a series. So a series is when we add up a sequence. Now, there's two ways to deal with series. The most common one is to try to figure out what they add up to. Not actually a good idea, because they're rather difficult to determine their values when you add them up. First off, notation. When we write a0 plus a1, and let's say we stop at a k, we want to say that we've done this addition. There's a starting and there's an end of the index. So we say, we take the Greek letter sigma, which means s, and that's for sum. So we're going to sum up. And now we use some sort of counting index. I like using i. So from sum from i equals 0, because that was my start, to k of a sub i, this is called the partial sum. We call it a partial sum because it's only the first so many entries of a series that might be infinitely long. The, the infinite series, we write like this. Now, the problem with an infinite series is we don't know if they add up. Think of the sequence a sub i equals i. That's the counting sequence. 1, 2, 3, 4, forever. If we're adding that up, 1, 1 plus 2, 1 plus 2 plus 3, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, this is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So, we don't know if this is going to add up, but it turns out the ones that do add up are really important because they help define the world around us in many ways. Physicists love these. Mathematicians like them. 
They really do make things happen. So, first off, we're interested in, again, should we try to figure out what it adds up to, or should we ask the question, does it even add up? See, some tools are very simple and they can tell you something. Other tools are really difficult. It turns out to determine what things add up to is very difficult. However, there are simple tools to determine if a series adds up. And so what we are going to do, just a ton of, is we're going to ask, does this series converge, meaning it adds up, and does this series diverge, meaning it doesn't add up? Now, the first and simple definition of convergent for a series is we say the limit as k goes to infinity of the sum from i equals 0 to k of a sub i equals l. That means we're saying it adds up to l, and this is convergence. Now, a standard notation for this number is called p sub k equals the sum from i equals, and it actually it may not be zero, so I'm going to put the start, but it's definitely the last term k of a sub i. This is called the kth partial sum. And then this therefore says, if you can figure out that the limit of something has a value, great. But now, let's just not worry about what the value is. Let's just ask, does the limit exist? If the answer is yes, you may not know the answer, but then you know the sum is going to be addable and you can work with it. Now, I'm going to demonstrate immediately why we love series and also remind you Back when we did trigonometry, it turned out that there was something very special about the limit of sine x over x as x goes to zero, that that produced the number one. This had to be done in radians for this to happen. On top of it, this caused the derivative of cosine to be minus sine, and it caused the derivative of sine to be cosine. And this is the reason that calculus is so nice, is that when you do it in radians, the rules are nice. If it hadn't been radians, there'd be funky numbers in front of here. So, I'm going to demonstrate a formulaic sequence for a known function, the cosine of x. When x is in radians, then it has a formula. It is 1 minus x squared over 2 plus x to the 4th over 4 factorial minus x to the 6th over 6 factorial plus x to the 8th over 8 factorial, this repetitive pattern. Now, how good is this? Well, I'm going to demonstrate here. I'm going to first turn on my, phone, my calculator here and show you I've drawn cosine of x. And that's a region from, I tried to get to, to 0 to almost 2 pi. I, I did it from 0 to 6. But you can see the cosine of x. Now, I've entered in here y1, and I've, I've made it not graph the cosine. It says y1 equals 1 minus x squared over 2 plus x to the fourth over 24. And I put nothing more in. So I am going to truncate this infinite rule. And I know this is an equal, but I'm going to show you that it's really quite close in the right space. So now I'm going to graph this again. And this is that polynomial. Now, kind of looked like it started, right? But then it went bad. So let's put both of them in there. Now I'm going to draw a cosine in there at the same time. And look at that. It's from like 0 to pi over 2. It's really accurate. I'm going to take this window here, and I'm going to zoom in a little bit. 
So I'm going to go from x min 0 and pi over 2, what is it, 1.5 approximately. Y min negative 1, y max 1. I'm trying to draw from draw this from 0 to pi halves, the two functions. So let's graph that. There comes in the first function. Here comes the second function. You can't see the difference except for a couple of pixels. Oh my goodness. This partial sum for cosine of x is so accurate that if you're pretty close to zero, that is the cosine of a number. And it's a way we can calculate. In fact, your calculator probably uses the first 16 or so ter um, pieces of the partial sum for cosine of x to make the answer. Now, we don't like putting x's in here when we first start. This is where we're going. So let's just look, look at a very famous sequence called the geometric series. So I'm going to let r be less than 1 but greater than minus 1. This is it. I'm going to define a sub n equals r to the n, n greater than or equal to 0. So what's it look like? a0 is 1, or 0. Oh, we shouldn't have 0 in here. Let's make it not 0, otherwise that doesn't make sense. 0 is 0. No. a1 is r, a2 is r squared, a3, r cubed. So now I'm going to write what the series looks like. Why? It would look like this. Now, it turns out that this specific series, there's a trick to adding it up. So I'm going to assume the answer is equal to the number s. So s is equal to 1 plus r plus r squared forever. I'm going to subtract 1 from each side forever. Now I'm going to factor out using the infinite distributive law, which by the way is really bad because we haven't even proved there's an infinite distributive law. But oh well, I'll just pretend. But what's weird is I just come full circle. This is where I started. So I get this equation without any ellipses. Well, I'll move this to one side, move the one to the other, factor out the s, and s equals 1 over 1 minus r. Well, lo and behold, I get an answer. Now, by the way, this answer doesn't make any sense if r is bigger than 1. I'd like you to notice. There's nowhere in here did I say anything about the value of r. I just said, if it adds up. Well, suppose I used r equals 2. Whoops, r equals 2. Well, a0 would be 1, a1 would be 2, a2 would be 2 squared. And somehow this formula would be saying s equals 1 over 1 minus 2, or negative 1. How can a series of increasing positive numbers add up to negative 1? <laughs> this proof has problems. It doesn't tell us that r needs to be less than 1. In fact, it doesn't tell us that r actually works between minus 1 and 1. It's just a proof that has problems, but it's actually right when you use r between minus 1 and 1. In fact, let's go back to our series that we talked about. Take a step from 0 to 1, take a half step, take a quarter step. You get closer and closer to 2, right? That was the series And this thing says that that adds up to 1 over 1 minus a half, which is 1 over a half, which is, lo and behold, 2, which is 2. Does that look like where we were heading? This is the geometric series. Now, I'm going to show you a proof that is correct, and then I'll prove that this is right with conditions on R. So here we go. I am going to write down instead of the infinite sum, I'm going to write down the kth partial sum of r to the i, i equals 0 to k, which is 1, 2, 
1 plus r plus r squared, and I go all the way up to k, and I'm going to do the same trick, but I'm going to leave it called p sub k, and now I'm going to solve, just like I did before. Subtract 1, factor out the r, but I don't get all of what I had started with. I only get everything but the last bit. So if I move this to the other side, this is everything but the last bit. It's everything except the last bit. Well, I'm going to solve for p sub k. Multiply the r, move the 1 to the other side, multiply that out. p sub k minus r p sub k equals 1 minus r to the k plus 1. Factor out p sub k. Divide. And I just got a formula for the kth partial sum of the geometric series, and there's no restrictions on r here whatsoever. This is perfectly good algebra. Now, what's really neat about this is I can now take a limit as k goes to infinity. Ready? First, I'm going to divide this and divide this, and I'm going to write p sub k equals 1 over 1 minus r minus r to the k plus 1 over 1 minus r. And when I take the limit as k goes to infinity, this is just a constant here because r is fixed before we start. r fixed. Well, minus 1 over 1 minus r, that same constant times r to the k plus 1, a limit of a constant, jump through it. We get this constant minus this constant times the limit as k goes to infinity of r to the k plus 1. Now back to Calc 1. If you take the power of a number less than 1 but bigger than minus 1, just as we saw on the screen last time, we get 0. But if r is bigger than 1, we get infinity. And here, the determination of r breaks this into two pieces. If r is between minus 1 and 1, this is 0. If r is bigger than equal to minus 1, and r is, sorry, plus 1, less than or equal to minus 1, it is infinite. So the answer is 1 over 1 minus r for the limit of this when r is in this region. So the geometric series, the sum of r to the k, k equals 0 to infinity equals 1 over 1 minus r with this one. And we need to memorize it. It is one of the most important series you'll ever see. Now, what happens if we add a constant in here? So here we go. How about I do the following? I take some sequence, some rule, and I modify it by multiplying by some constant. Let's call it c times a sub n. Well, the sequence is different, but the series is actually very little different. Ready? If we want to look at summing up at the a sub n, versus summing up the b sub n, why the b sub n is going to be c a 0 plus c a 1 plus why the c factors out and it looks like we have the following cool rule. The sum of a constant times a series sequence when in a series is a constant if this is finite, this is finite. If this diverges, then so does that. It gets bad. This is called the algebra of series. So one thing about series is we can pull, put in a constant in there. So ready? The sum of a r to the n, n equals 0 to infinity, lo and behold, is a over 1 minus r, provided r is between 1 and minus 1. Pretty crazy. So, now comes the question of any good mathematician can make this harder, right? So let's try to see if we can write a specific problem. Let's do the sum of 2 to the k 
plus 1, 3 to the minus k, k equals 3 to infinity. What is this? What does it look like? Well, one thing is just start writing it out. So let's put in k equals 3. We get 2 to the 4th, 3 to the minus 3rd, plus, put in k equals 4. 2 to the 5th, 3 minus 4, put in 5. 2 to the 6th, 3 to the minus 5th. We see a pattern. I'm going to write it out. 2 to the 4th over 3 cubed, plus 2 to the 5th over 3 to the 4th, plus 2 to the 6th over 3 to the 5th. Now, I want you to notice, because we started at 3, the powers of 2 started at 4. And because we started at 3, the powers of 3 started at 3. I'm going to pull the common thing out. I'm going to take 2 to the 4th, 3 cubed out, and that's going to leave a 1. What's going to be left here? Well, 4 of the 2's go, 1 of the 3's, well, I'll get a 2 thirds. Take out 4 of the 2's and 3 of the 3's, we're going to get 2 thirds squared. And lo and behold, something that looks kind of like a geometric is actually a geometric series. It's some constant times the sum of r to the n, n equals 0 to infinity, which we know will be 1 over 1 minus 2 thirds. And we can get an answer. So when you have these funky powers and different starting points with terms, you can actually make it look like a normal geometric series. So what's the theory of that one look like? Well, let me just demonstrate. It's the sum. If you have some starting point of a, r to the uh, k going to infinity, well, the a, r to the start pulls out and you get 1 plus r plus r squared. And so when you don't start at the normal spot and you have different things in there, then it really does reduce to a geometric series. Now, geometric series uh, are extremely powerful series. And one thing that's very interesting about geometric series is that they are known to add up to a specific value. Very unusual. There's another series that behaves this way. It's called a telescoping series. I don't know if you've ever seen those old-fashioned telescopes that collapse and pull out. I'm going to write a series that looks like this. I'm actually going to follow very closely. This is example 8 on page 712. I'm going to write down a series. Let's do this series from i equals 1 to infinity of 1 over i times i. Hopefully they put plus 1. All right. Let's put in 1. We get 1 over 1 times 2. Let's put in 2. We get 1 over 2 times 3. Let's put in 3. We get 1 over 3 times 4. Uh, it's one of those series that looks oddball. Now, does it add up? Good question. Well, it turns out that when you have polynomials in the bottom and polynomials in the top, we're going to use partial fraction decomposition, just like we did with integration. It's very powerful. So I'm going to write 1 over i, i plus 1, as a over i plus b over i plus 1, and try to solve it. Well, it turns out a is 1 and b is minus 1. Now, I'm going to rewrite this using this fact. So here we go. I'm wanting to add up from the very first possible term. I, I obviously can't start at i equals 0, so the start is 1. It's actually from i equals 1 to infinity of 1 over i plus minus 1 over i plus 1. Now what good is this? Well, I'm going to write it out. We saw that that one looked weird. That was. But now I'm going to write it this way. What this does is make each one of these break into two pieces. So it actually makes my series twice as long, but twice infinity is infinity, right? So who cares? Here we go. Put in 1. 1 over 1 plus minus 1 over 2. 
Next one, put in 2. 1 over 2 plus minus 1 over 3. Put in the next one, plus 1 over 3 plus minus 1 over 4. And oh my goodness, the last of this term is canceling the first of that term. Canceling, canceling, canceling. What's happening here is if you actually write down p sub k for this one, you just add up the first k terms. Lo and behold, you get 1 over 1, and the surviving 1 will be a minus 1 over k plus 1. So we can actually solve the partial sums, and now if we take the limit, k goes to infinity of this p sub k, this will go to 0, and the answer will be 1. This adds up to 1. That adds up to 1. Didn't see it coming. So... Here is a very important fact, and I totally missed this as an undergraduate. I didn't get it. I was really good at testing convergence and divergence and understanding series and sequence. What I totally blew off is why do we simply check for convergence? Why do we simply check for divergence? And why sometimes do we actually get to add them up? Well, the answer is geometric and telescoping are special. They simply are. And we know how to add them up. We have techniques for adding them up, and they give us very, very specific values. Now, here's a theorem that I'm not going to prove, but it's really important to understand the idea of it. Suppose someone told you that they knew that it adds up to a number L. This is the same as saying converges. Well, how in the world can I get some information out of this when they don't even give me the series? Don't even give me the sequence that makes the series. Well, the answer is I know these things have to get small because if they stay above any finite small number but stay above it, when you add, 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 add forever, a penny forever will add up to an infinite amount. A tenth of a cent forever will add up to an infinite amount. This means that the terms of these guys have to go to zero. They have to get small. The only series that we would ever think of adding up are the terms that get small. Now, there's the flip of this called the contrapositive. So if this converges, then these things get small. If these things don't get small, then this diverges. It doesn't add up. These are the same statement of fact. One's the contrapositive of the other. So convergent series have very small terms, but terms that don't get small means it doesn't add up. This right here happens to be have a special name. Just look at the terms, ask how they go, and then you'll know if you should even bother to add up. It's called the divergence test. That's kind of cool. So let me show you a divergent series. Let's add up the sum of n plus 1 over n, n equals 7 to infinity. Now I'm going to write out some terms. 8 sevenths, 9 eighths, 10 ninths, 11 tenths. Well, you guys notice that these numbers are getting closer and closer to 1? In fact, it's hard, not hard to notice this. Ready? Note. The limit is n goes to infinity of a sub n is the limit as n goes to infinity of n plus 1 over n, which is 1 plus 1 over n. And as n goes to infinity, that goes to 0, so the answer is 1. And that number is not a small number. So this 
diverges. Nobody should bother to add up an infinite series like this. So when you know something doesn't get small, don't even bother adding it up. But I need to warn you, the convergence of a series doesn't mean it's just enough that the terms get small. I'm going to show you a, a sequence, and it's a special sequence. It has a name. It's called the harmonic series a sequence. R, there's an R and an M. At, at, yeah, harmonic sequence. So. There it goes. Now, I'm going to show you a little trick. Tricks in algebra are very powerful. This is just a trick to show you. I know this thing can't really add up. Ready? I'm going to look at a, a piece of K. One plus a half plus a third plus a fourth plus a fifth plus a sixth plus a seventh plus an eighth out to one over K. And I want you to notice. This is bigger than a half. 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 Why are they bigger than a half? Well, one third is bigger than a quarter. We have two numbers bigger than a quarter that add up to half. Four numbers. Three of them bigger than an eighth. One is an eighth. Four eighths, bigger than a half. Every chunk of one, one, two, four, eight, six is bigger than a half. So I have piece of it, K growing. Every time I get far enough, I grab a half. Far enough, grab a half. Grab a far enough, grab a half. This doesn't converge. It's growing forever by additions of one half. Keeps on going up and up and up. This diverges. But its terms individually get small. So it's not enough to get small. Well, the last thing I'm going to give you is things about known convergent series. And that is when you have a constant, then you can pull it out. Now, this gets really tiresome to write. We know there's a starting point. We know if we're talking about the setting as an infinite series, I'm going to stop writing. I'm just going to write down common notation. Some infinite series with a sub n plus b sub n, when they're convergent, they can be reorganized. This is called the infinite commutative law. Let's look at the left. That's, let's say it starts at 0. a0 plus b0 plus a1 plus b1 plus a2 plus b2 forever. And we're going to move all the a's together and all the b's together. That means a is way over here. It's got to go you know, 20, 30, 100 to the left to get a0 plus a1 plus a2 forever. And then the b0 plus b1 for. So I move. Yeah, that's what that says. That seems like a theorem. It is. And if this was a minus, same thing. But it doesn't work for the other facts. Sorry. Just constant multiplication and addition and subtraction. All right, that's it.